The black void of space stretched infinitely around us, a cold, uncaring expanse that swallowed light and hope alike. The spaceship Ascendant drifted towards the planet Vortis, a dusty red orb suspended in the cosmic void. I stood on the bridge, my fingers tapping on the console. Captain Marcus peered at the screen, analyzing the data flowing from our sensors. Something's not right about those moons, he muttered, more to himself than to any of us. His face, worn by years of space travel, was set in a deep frown. I glanced at the display. The moons of Vortis were too perfect, too symmetrical. Their surfaces glinted, and their orbits were too precise. Marcus's instincts were seldom wrong. I watched as he highlighted the largest of the moons, its surface appearing almost metallic under the scanner's gaze. Prepare for a closer inspection, Marcus ordered. Lydia, get the EVA suits ready. Arlen, I need a full scan of that moon. Cole, plot a course for orbital insertion. We moved like a well-oiled machine, thanks to our shared experience. Lydia, our engineer, vanished into the equipment bay. Dr. Arlen, our scientist, began adjusting the sensors. Cole, our pilot, guided the Ascendant into a stable orbit around the largest moon. Time seemed to slow as we prepared to descend. The Ascendant's thrusters fired in controlled bursts, easing us closer to the moon's surface. As we descended, the scale of the structure became apparent. This was no ordinary moon. Its surface was a lattice of interconnected metal plates, vast and seamless, stretching beyond our view. Landing sequence initiated, Cole announced. The landing gear extended with a thud and we touched down on the alien surface. The atmosphere inside the Ascendant was tense. We donned our EVA suits in silence, the familiar routine offering little comfort against the unknown. The airlock hissed as it depressurized, and the outer door slid open with a groan. I followed Marcus out onto the moon's surface, the gravity lighter than Earth's but enough to keep us grounded. The artificiality of the ground was unmistakable. The horizon was dominated by towering structures, spires of dark metal that seemed to pierce the sky. Over here, Marcus called, his voice crackling over the comm. He was standing by what looked like an entrance, a massive circular hatch embedded in the ground. It was covered in alien glyphs, their meaning lost to time. Lydia approached the hatch, her tools clinking softly as she inspected it. This isn't just a moon, she said. It's a megastructure, ancient but still functional. Dr. Arlen joined us, his scanner beeping as it analyzed the glyphs. These markings, they're instructions, warnings maybe. Let's find out what's inside, Marcus said, his tone leaving no room for argument. Lydia activated the hatch's mechanism, and with a low rumble it began to open, revealing a dark tunnel leading down into the moon's depths. The descent into the tunnel was slow, each step taking us further from the safety of the Ascendant. The walls were lined with more glyphs, their glow illuminating the path with an eerie dim light. At the bottom of the tunnel, we emerged into a vast space. Ancient machinery lay dormant, covered in dust and time-worn. The scale of the place was overwhelming. This discovery revealed the remnants of a forgotten civilization with technology far superior to anything we have today. We pressed forward, the sound of our steps filling the space. The light from our suits barely pierced the darkness, revealing glimpses of alien machinery and strange, angular structures. Marcus led the way. Lydia followed close behind, her eyes scanning the surroundings with curiosity and wariness. Dr. Arlen was last, his scanner beeping periodically as it collected data. This place is incredible, Arlen muttered, his voice filled with excitement. We're walking through history. The corridor branched off in several directions, each path as spooky as the next. Marcus chose a path at random and we followed. The low hum got louder, filling the room with a constant vibration from the walls. Do you think this place still has power? Lydia asked. Seems like it, Marcus answered. But if it does, it's been dormant for a long time. We reached another hall, smaller than the first, but filled with more machinery. Alien consoles lined the walls, covered in dust and grime. Screens flashed weakly, 
displaying incomprehensible symbols and diagrams. Let's see if we can get some of this working, Lydia said, moving towards one of the consoles. She brushed off the dust and began examining the controls, her fingers manipulating the alien technology. Be careful, Marcus warned. We don't want to trigger anything. I'll just run a diagnostic, see if we can understand what any of this does. While Lydia worked, Arlen wandered around the room, his scanner flashing and beeping. He stopped at a large cylindrical device in the center of the room, his eyes widening in recognition. This looks like some kind of reactor, he said. If I'm right, this whole place could be powered by it. Marcus joined him inspecting the device. Can we turn it on? Possibly, Arlen replied. But we should be cautious. We don't know what systems might be connected to it. As they deliberated, I kept watch, my eyes scanning the dark corners of the room. Something felt off. Lydia finally stepped back from the console, a look of satisfaction on her face. I think I've got something. I'm going to try and bring up some basic systems. She pressed a series of buttons and the console came to life, lights turning on. The screens displayed more symbols, but now they were accompanied by diagrams of the moon's interior. A map of sorts. This should help us navigate, she said. It looks like there are several levels to this place, each with different functions. Marcus studied the map. Let's move to the next level, see what else we can find. The map led us to a steep, narrow stairwell descending into darkness. At the bottom, we emerged into another corridor, this one lined with large metal doors. Each door had a small window, allowing us to peer inside. Most of the rooms were empty, filled with only dust and rubble. But one room caught our attention. Behind the window, rows of cylindrical pods lined the walls, each one filled with greenish fluid. The pods were covered in frost, and their surfaces were etched with more alien glyphs. Lydia approached cautiously, wiping away the frost to get a better look inside. What are these? She asked, her voice a whisper. Dr. Arlen's face paled as he examined the pods. Cryogenic chambers, he said. These, these could be stasis pods. Marcus's eyes narrowed. Stasis pods? For what? Not what, Arlen replied grimly. Who? The implications were clear. Whoever had built this place had the technology to preserve life, perhaps even to revive it. The question was, what had happened to them? And why had they left this place abandoned? We pressed on, the corridor twisting and turning like a labyrinth. The further we went, the more uneasy I felt. At the end of the corridor, we found another door, larger and more ornate than the others. Marcus hesitated, his hand hovering over the control panel. Ready? He asked, looking at each of us in turn. We nodded, and he pressed the button. The door slid open with a heavy groan, revealing a vast room bathed in a green light. The source of the light was a massive, crystalline structure in the center of the room. Dr. Arlen approached the crystal, his scanner in hand. The device beeped and whirred, struggling to make sense of the data it was collecting. This structure, it's some kind of power source. Can we use it? Lydia asked, her eyes wide with fascination. Possibly. Arlen replied, but we need to be very careful. One wrong move could set off a chain reaction. I stayed by the door, my eyes darting between the shadowy corners of the room and my crewmates. Lydia managed to power up one of the consoles, the screen coming to life with a cascade of alien symbols. These glyphs, they're a language, she said. I'm trying to translate, but it's slow going. Arlen continued to analyze the crystal this power source. It's linked to the entire structure. If we can figure out how it works, we might be able to control the systems here. A sudden noise broke the tense silence, a grinding sound that seemed to come from the walls. I spun around, my heart pounding. The walls shifted slightly, as if the entire chamber were alive and reacting to our presence. Lydia let out a triumphant cry as the console finally displayed something comprehensible. I've got it. This place, it's a kind of outpost, a research facility. The inhabitants were studying something. 
I can't make out all the details, but they were definitely experimenting with this energy source. Experiments, Arlen repeated. His interest peaked. What kind of experiments? Something to do with stasis and energy manipulation, Lydia said, her eyes scanning the screen. It's all very advanced, way beyond our current understanding. The grinding noise intensified, and suddenly, the crystalline structure in the centre of the room flashed brighter. We've triggered something, Arlen said. I think the crystal is reacting to us. The moment those words left his mouth, a sudden violent tremor shook the ground beneath us, sending a cascade of dust and rubble raining down from the ceiling. As we turned to flee, the walls of the room began to shift and reconfigure. Panels slid open revealing hidden alcoves. From these alcoves emerged tall, menacing figures, mechanical alien guardians. We bolted down the corridor, the guardians in pursuit. They were terrifyingly fast, closing the distance between us with alarming speed. My heart pounded in my chest as I pushed myself to run faster, the sound of our footsteps drowned out by the mechanical clattering of the guardians. As we reached the first stairwell, I risked a glance over my shoulder. The Guardians never took their eyes off us, their gaze cold and threatening. Arlen stumbled, and Marcus grabbed him, pulling him back to his feet. We descended the stairs as quickly as we could, the aliens hot on our heels. The narrow stairwell provided a brief advantage, slowing our pursuers just enough to give us a chance. But I knew it wouldn't last. We needed a plan. And fast. At the bottom of the stairs, we found ourselves in another corridor, this one lined with more of the strange, angular consoles. Lydia darted towards one. Buy me some time, she said, her voice echoing in the confined space. Marcus and I turned to face the approaching guardians, weapons drawn. The first of the creatures rounded the corner, its glowing eyes fixed on us. I fired, the shot hitting the guardian squarely in the chest. It staggered but didn't fall. Instead, it raised an arm and a blinding beam of energy shot towards us. Marcus dove behind a console, and I followed, narrowly avoiding the beam that scorched the wall behind me. Marcus returned fire, aiming for the creature's head. This time the shot connected, and the Guardian collapsed in a heap, its eyes dimming. But there were more coming. I could hear the clatter of their approach, a tide of metal. The next wave of Guardians appeared, and we opened fire, our shots slowing them down. One of them flew towards me, its clawed hand reaching for my throat. I fired point-blank, and the Guardian fell, its grip loosening. I've got it, Lydia said triumphantly. This way! A door at the end of the corridor slid open, revealing a narrow passage. We sprinted towards it, Marcus covering our retreat with a final barrage of gunfire. The door slid shut behind us, sealing us in the passage. That won't hold them for long, Arlen said, his breath coming in gasps. The passage led us deeper into the megastructure. The green glow from the crystal had diminished, replaced by the lights of the ancient facility. We navigated through the corridors, our movements driven by fear and the instinct to survive. We stumbled into a large, circular room. In the centre stood a massive, ornate door, covered in more of the alien glyphs. It was clear this was no ordinary door. It was a gateway to something important, possibly our way out. Lydia, can you get this open? Marcus asked, his voice tense. Lydia hurried to the door, examining the controls. It looks like it requires a key, something to activate the mechanism. Give me a moment. The sound of the guardians grew louder, coming through the corridors behind us. We didn't have much time. I scanned the room, looking for anything that might help us. There... On a pedestal to the right of the door was a crystalline object. Is that it? I asked, pointing to the object. Could be, Lydia said, rushing over to it. She carefully lifted the crystal and brought it back to the door. The moment she placed it in the corresponding slot, the glyphs on the door began to glow, and the massive structure started to rumble. Hurry, Lydia, Marcus urged, his eyes fixed on the corridor entrance. With a grinding noise, the door began to slide open, revealing a dark tunnel beyond. We wasted no time, rushing through the opening. As the door started to close behind us, 
I caught a glimpse of the guardians entering the room. The door sealed shut and we found ourselves in a narrow tunnel. The walls here were different, smoother and more polished, as if this part of the structure had been better maintained. We pressed on, the tunnel leading us deeper into the heart of the megastructure. We found ourselves in a more compact space, full of cutting-edge machinery. In the centre stood a large circular platform. This looks like a transport system, Arlen said. It might be our way out. How do we activate it? Marcus asked, his eyes scanning the room. Lydia approached the platform, examining the controls. It's similar to the other systems we've seen. I think I can get it working. We could hear the Guardians getting closer as Lydia worked. Hurry, Lydia, I urged, my nerves fraying. The platform began to hum, the alien symbols lighting up one by one. Everyone onto the platform, Marcus ordered. We stepped onto the platform and Lydia pressed a final button. The equipment around us roared to life and the room was filled with a blinding light. I felt a sudden lurch, as if the ground had dropped out from beneath us. When the light faded, we found ourselves in a different room. The walls here were smooth and polished. We had made it to another part of the megastructure, hopefully closer to an exit. Where are we? I asked. Arlen checked his scanner. We're deeper inside, but I think I can find a way to the surface from here. His voice trembled slightly, betraying the fear we all felt. The Guardians wouldn't stop, and every second wasted put us closer to capture. We moved quickly, navigating through the corridors. Nothing could have prepared us for the first room. The door slid open to reveal a chamber filled with organic pods, each one casting greenish light. I stepped inside, my stomach twisting as I realized what we were looking at. This is... a nursery, Arlen whispered, his voice filled with horror. They were growing something here. The pods were large and oval-shaped, covered in a thin, translucent membrane. Inside, we could see the half-formed shapes of alien embryos. Their limbs twitched spasmodically, and their eyes, already glowing with that green light, seemed to track our movements. Let's get out of here, Lydia said, her voice shaking. We don't need to see this. We moved on, but the image of those embryos stayed with me, a constant reminder of the nightmare we were trapped in. The corridors led us deeper into the facility. Each step brought new horrors. The next room we found was even worse. The door creaked open to reveal a torture chamber. Gruesome devices filled the space, each one clearly designed to inflict maximum pain. Some were still stained with dried, dark alien liquid remnants of previous victims. I felt sick as I took in the sight. One device caught my attention, a chair with spiked restraints and a head clamp. I could almost hear the screams of the poor souls who had been subjected to its horrors. The walls were covered in alien symbols, their meaning lost to us, but clearly meant to convey pain and suffering. We're wasting time, Marcus said sharply, pulling us out of our horrified trance. Let's go. After walking seemingly endlessly, the corridor opened up into a large hall. As we stepped inside, I realized the walls were lined with mirrors, tall, distorted panels that reflected our images back at us. The reflections were unsettling, their surfaces rippling slightly as if the glass were liquid. This is bizarre, Lydia muttered, her voice echoing softly in the vast space. Why would they have a room full of mirrors? Maybe it's some kind of surveillance system, Arlen suggested, his eyes scanning the room warily. We moved through the hall, our reflections shifting and warping in the mirrors. At first, the reflections seemed normal, if slightly distorted. But as we walked further into the room, something changed. The reflections began to move independently, their actions no longer mirroring our own. Did you see that? I asked, stopping in my tracks. My reflection had just turned to look at me, a mocking smile on its face. See what? Marcus replied, his eyes darting around the room. The reflections, they're moving on their own. As if on cue, the reflections in the mirrors began to shift, their movements becoming more exaggerated. They started mimicking our actions, but in a grotesque, mocking manner. When I raised my hand, my reflection did the same. 
but with a cruel, twisted grin that sent a chill down my spine. The reflections seemed to demand our attention, their eyes following us as we moved. They started to laugh, a mocking sound that echoed eerily in the hall. I felt a rising sense of panic, my heart pounding in my chest. Ignore them, Lydia said, though her voice shook. They're just reflections. But they didn't feel like just reflections. They felt alive. As we moved deeper into the hall, the reflections became more aggressive. They banged on the glass, their faces contorted in terror, unable to make a sound. This isn't real, I whispered to myself, trying to stay focused. It's just a trick. But it was hard to believe that as the reflections grew more frenzied. They began to pound on the mirrors with their fists, the sound of the glass reverberating through the hall. I could see the fear in my own eyes, mirrored a hundred times over. We have to find the exit, Marcus said, his voice barely audible over the cacophony. There has to be a way out. They started to attack each other, their hands tearing at their mirrored flesh. The sight was horrifying, a perverse imitation of our own suffering. As we neared the far end of the hall, I saw a door, an exit, but it was blocked by a massive mirror, its surface rippling like water. The reflection in the mirror was of me, but deformed, its eyes filled with malice. We need to break through, Marcus said. He picked up a piece of metal from the floor and swung it at the mirror with all his might. The glass shattered and the confined area amplified the sound. The reflection dissolved into a thousand fragments, each one reflecting a tiny piece of our nightmare. Beyond the broken mirror was the door, our way out. We rushed towards the exit, the broken glass crunching under our boots. As we burst through the door, the mocking laughter of the reflections faded, replaced by the familiar hum of the alien facility. We found ourselves in another corridor, the walls once again lined with symbols. Marcus led the way, his weapon at the ready. Lydia and Arlen followed close behind, their faces tense. I brought up the rear, glancing over my shoulder every few steps, half expecting to see the reflections from the Hall of Mirrors come to life and follow us. After a while, we reached a large open space. It was filled with more advanced equipment, and in the center stood a massive circular platform, similar to the one we had used earlier. But this time, the platform was surrounded by a ring of alien guardians. Get ready, Marcus said, raising his weapon. We're not getting past them without a fight. The guardians moved, their mechanical limbs whirring softly. They formed a tight perimeter around the platform, their eyes locked onto us. I could feel the tension in the air, the anticipation of the imminent battle. We moved quickly, taking up positions around the space. The guardians reacted instantly. One of them attacked, its arms out. I fired my weapon, the shot hitting it squarely in the chest. It staggered but didn't fall. Lydia and Arlen joined the fight, their weapons blazing. The space was filled with the sounds of gunfire and the clatter of the guardians. One by one, we managed to take them down. We need to get to that platform, Marcus said. Lydia, can you get it working? I'll try, Lydia replied, moving towards the control panel. We formed a protective circle around Lydia as she worked. The guardians pressed their attack their eyes glowing brighter with every moment. I felt a sharp pain as one of them raked its claws across my arm, tearing through my suit. The platform began to hum, the symbols lighting up one by one. The air crackled with energy, and I felt a surge of hope. I fired at another guardian, the shot hitting it in the head. It collapsed in a heap, its eyes dimming out. But there were still more, and they were closing in. Come on, come on, Lydia muttered her hands moving. Finally, the platform activated. A blinding light filled the room and the guardians hesitated, their movements faltering. We rushed onto the platform, the light intensifying around us. The guardians hesitated, their movements faltering in the face of the blinding energy field. The light grew even brighter and I felt the ground drop out from beneath us. We were so close, the platform's power ready to transport us to the surface but then a scream pierced through the noise. 
I turned just in time to see one of the Guardians grab Arlen by the leg, yanking him off the platform. His eyes were wide with terror as he was dragged across the floor, his fingers scraping against the metal in a futile attempt to hold on. The Guardian lifted Arlen into the air, its clawed hand digging into his suit. With a sickening crunch, it tore into his flesh, the sound of bones breaking and muscles tearing echoing through the chamber. Blood sprayed across the floor, and Arlen's screams turned into gurgling gasps as the creature continued to rip him apart. The platform's light intensified once more, and with a blinding flash, we were transported away, leaving Arlen's mutilated body behind. When the light faded, we found ourselves in another corridor. We lost him, Lydia whispered, her voice breaking. We have to keep going, Marcus said, his voice hard. We're not safe yet. We moved forward, our steps heavy with the weight of Arlen's death. The corridor led us upwards, and the faint light at the end of the tunnel grew brighter. Finally, we emerged onto the surface. The stars above were a welcome sight, and the Ascendant stood waiting, a promise of safety. We hurried across the surface, our footsteps crunching on the ground. The Guardians were nowhere to be seen, but the memory of their brutality drove us forward. As we reached the airlock of the Ascendant, Marcus turned to face us. Let's get inside and get out of here. We've got a lot to report, but our first priority is getting clear of this moon. We climbed inside, sealing the airlock behind us. The familiar hum of the ship's engines was a comforting sound, and as Cole fired up the controls, the Ascendant lifted off, leaving the alien megastructure behind. We were safe, or so it seemed. But the sense of relief was overshadowed by the grim reality of our losses and the horrors we had witnessed. Marcus, Lydia, Cole and I gathered on the bridge, the silence between us heavy and suffocating. The stars outside the viewport were cold and indifferent, a stark contrast to the warm light of our home star systems. The hum of the ship's engines was the only sound, a steady reminder of our tenuous grip on safety. We need to send a report, Marcus said, his voice breaking the silence. They need to know what we found down there. They need to know what it cost us, Lydia added, her eyes hollow. As Cole adjusted the communications array, a sudden tremor ran through the ship. We turned to the viewport, eyes widening in horror. Beneath the surface of Vortis, something immense was stirring. The ground cracked and heaved, great fissures spreading like spiderwebs across the landscape. From the depths of the moon emerged a massive alien entity, its size dwarfing the Ascendant. It was an abomination of flesh and machinery, a colossal amalgamation of organic and synthetic parts, bristling with multiple limbs and eyes. Oh my God, Lydia whispered. What have we done? The entity rose higher, breaking free from the moon's crust with a roar that travelled through the void of space. The sense of insignificance and dread was overwhelming. We were nothing but insects in the presence of this cosmic horror. Cole pushed the engines to their limit, the Ascendant accelerating away from the moon. But the entity was not deterred. It reached out with one of its colossal limbs, the movement slow but inexorable. The space around us seemed to warp and distort, as if reality itself was bending under the weight of the creature's presence. As we sped away, the alien entity began to change, its limbs extended, stretching across the void, reaching for us. The stars themselves seemed to dim, their light swallowed by the sheer enormity of the creature. It was as if the universe was bending to its will, the fabric of space-time warping in its wake. What is that thing? I asked, my voice barely a whisper. Something that should have stayed buried, Marcus replied grimly. We've awakened an ancient horror. The ship's sensors went haywire, unable to comprehend the entity's presence. The screen displayed nothing but static and distorted images, the ship's systems struggling to process the sheer magnitude of what we were witnessing. As the Ascendant pushed further into the void, the entity continued to follow, its colossal form drifting through space with a terrifying grace. The distance between us and the moon grew, but the entity remained ever-present. 
Can we outrun it? Lydia asked. I don't know, Cole replied, his hands gripping the controls tightly. Prepare for hyperjump. The ship's engine surged as Cole initiated the hyperjump sequence. The stars outside the viewport blurred into streaks of light, the immense pressure of the jump building around us. With a blinding flash, the Ascendant lurched forward, tearing through the fabric of space-time. The sensation was disorienting, the ship shuddering violently as it sped through the void. When the turbulence finally subsided, the viewport revealed a calm, star-filled expanse. We had escaped, but the reality of our situation settled in, a terrifying realization that we had unleashed an ancient horror into the universe. Lydia broke the silence. Do you think it can follow us? Marcus stared into the vastness of space. I don't know, but we have to warn everyone. Whatever that thing is, it's awake now and we have no idea what it's capable of. The journey home on the Ascendant felt empty, overshadowed by the terror of Vortis. The cosmic horror we had unleashed was still out there, and the lingering fear made it clear that the nightmare was not over yet.